A warm welcome, first of all, to everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Bonducci, and I'm the initiator and then later the director of the Insiders Outsiders Festival, which started in March 2019, ended officially, but rather sort of prematurely, in March 2020, a nationwide year-long arts festival that was designed to pay homage, but also to look in a more nuanced and uh, analytical sort of way at the immense contribution made to British culture by those who found sanctuary here from Nazi-dominated Europe. And I have to say that quite unexpectedly, the current lockdown has opened up all sorts of possibilities that I didn't really anticipate or even begin to think about in terms of how we communicate, how one can keep the uh, theme of the festival very much in the public eye with minimum effort in a, in a way, famous last words, but you know, it is relatively easy to set up Zoom events like this. And of course, the wonderful advantage is that we can reach so many more people across the world. So some of you I'm sure will have already attended uh, some of the earlier sessions that started on, on Monday. And indeed, as many of you will be aware, because, well, it's Refugee Week, of course, this week, UK-wide, really important for us that past and present be intimately linked together. But also because this early summer, as I'm sure a lot of you attending this particular session will know full well, marks the 80th anniversary of the infamous, problematic, to put it more politely, uh, British government's internment of so-called enemy aliens, mostly but not exclusively, on the Isle of Man in the summer of 1940. So it seemed a very apposite moment to focus in on this thorny and very fascinating topic. Um, some of you uh, may well have attended, I'm sorry, I simply cannot sort of keep tabs on who uh, is listening in at any one time, but there was a fascinating talk on uh, Monday evening about Wharf Mills, uh, I'd love to put the hands up, but I can't really do that. Um, Wharf Mills is one of the lesser known. It was a sort of transit camp. People were only there for a short while. But it's a very good example of how so little is known about the lesser known, the sort of less familiar names. I think most of us, particularly most of us attending the session today, will know that most of the internees ended up on the Isle of Man. But what many people to this day do not know enough about is how poor the conditions were in many cases, most notoriously at Wharf Mills, uh, which kind of paved the way to their longer term internment on, on the Isle of Man. And I mentioned that in particular because I'm sure um, Simon will uh, explain in more detail quite a few of the eminent artists who ended up in Hutchinson camp, which is going to be the main focus of his talk, were indeed also in Wharf Mills. So sort of fascinating connections all along the way between the different sessions. Right. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the AJR, first of all, for acting as partners in this week's enterprise. Um, if you're not aware of their activities, the wonderful work they do, please do check out their website. And in particular, um, I'd like to alert you to a brand new microsite, as they've called it, on the Association of Jewish Refugees website, devoted ex specifically, quite explicitly, to excerpts from the recorded memoirs of their members regarding their experience of internment. So this is a very useful new resource for everyone. What else? Um, some very practical issues. You've probably heard it all before, but let me just uh, go through them for, for the sake of protocol. Uh, you will notice that I think everyone has been muted. We're going to keep you muted, I'm afraid, to prevent any sort of uh, noise interference as Simon is talking. If you wish to ask questions, and I do, we of course welcome questions at the end of Simon's presentation, please type them in, keep them brief, type them in through the chat option, which is at the bottom, middle bottom of everybody's screen, and uh, they will automatically be directed to me, and I will then sort of channel them, as it were, to, to Simon. Um, I would suggest keeping um, the speaker view option on, because then you will be able to concentrate on Simon himself. Um, the other thing I need to mention is that all the events this week are being automatically recorded, and the plan is to upload them onto YouTube for general kind of access from next week onwards. If anybody doesn't want to be recorded, to be seen, then simply turn off your um, video camera logo and you will become totally invisible. Good. Um, I think now the most important part of the proceedings is to, for me to introduce Simon Parkin to the assembled company. And let me just do that very briefly. Simon's an award-winning British author and journalist, and the roster of publications to which he contributes regularly is impressive, The New Yorker for starters, The Guardian, and um, The Observer. 
His recent book is uh, fascinating, A Game of Birds and Wolves, it's called. And like his new project, which he's going to be talking about, it seems to me, Simon, you have a real kind of gift for sniffing out you know, the unfamiliar, the underexplored aspects of wartime history and rendering them accessible in a quasi novelistic, but you know, um, factually based way. So the, um, the game, A Game of Birds and Wolves, explores the role of a group of um, young women in particular and a retired naval officer who developed a war game that helped lead the Allies to victory uh, against the German U boats. Uh, during the Battle of the Atlantic, and it was described uh, by the book list as history writing at its best. Very nice. His new project, which you will all be aware of, The Island of Extraordinary Captives, a lovely title, um, uh, is, tells the story of Hutchinson Camp, an internment camp on the Isle of Man during the Second World War, uh, that housed one of the most astonishing array of inmates ever assembled, I think, in almost any internment camp for history and across the world. Um, and I'd just like to end by quoting from Simon himself, which, which rings a chord with me, strikes a chord with me. He said, he asked me to read this out. He said, while the world reckons with the greatest refugee emergency of recent decades, this timely story from the Second World War will explore what it takes for a country to retreat from compassion into fear and for individuals to stand up to injustice. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much, Rob. I'm going to just share my screen with you because I've got some slides to show. So I'll do that now. Hopefully you can all see that now. Um, thank you, Monica. So I've been working on this book for about a year, but there's still some way to go. Um, it's in fact not been formally announced yet and there's no form, there's no publication date, but um, it's due at the end of this year. And so it will be coming at some point. Um, normally, I wouldn't speak so early about a, a, in the process about a project, but Monica so generously offered the chance to share the fruits of my research so far. So uh, just to sort of pressy this by saying that while I'm confident everything I'm going to share with you today is factual, it hasn't actually been through a formal fact checking process. So please bear that in mind. Um, and also, I am not a fluent German speaker. I know that many of you are. So please forgive any incorrect pronunciations. Okay. Marjan Rowitz surveyed the crowd gathered on the terrace lawn in front of his grand piano. Rowitz was used to giving well-attended performances at illustrious venues. During the past few years, the 42-year-old musician had become something of an international celebrity. A frequent guest of kings and presidents, he had first come to Britain to perform for the Prince of Wales. For today's out outdoor concert, however, there were no tuxedos, or ball, ball gowns, no flutes of champagne. Behind your wits rose a backdrop of 45 neat Edwardian boarding houses. The buildings were curious looking. Each window was a shade of dark blue and etched with drawings of zoo animals, unicorns and characters from Greek myth. Viewed from outside, the pictures which had been scratched with razor blades glowed menacingly with the light of brothel red light bulbs indoors. It was a novel backdrop for the celebrated concert pianist. In front of Rowitz, on a crescent of wooden chairs, sat a line of army officers, laughing and smoking next to their wives. And behind the uniformed men, in untidy rows on the grass, sat hundreds of refugees. Rowitz could see from his vantage point the sea vanishing into an infinity of sky. Never before had the pianist given a clifftop performance like this. Then again, never before had he been a pr prisoner of His Majesty's government. In the middle distance, Drewitz glimpsed a palisade of barbed wire, the perimeter that marked the boundary of what was now known as P Camp or Hutchinson, the only clue to the fact that this was a captive audience. Hutchinson Camp opened officially on the 13th of July, 1940. It was one of a number of internment camps situated on the Isle of Man, an island sufficiently far from the neighboring coast to be ideally suited for imprisonment. The camp was designed to house more than a thousand prisoners, mainly German, Austrian and Italian passport holders living in Britain who, from May 1940, were arrested in a country gripped by spy fever. Rumours abounded that a so-called fifth column of Nazi sympathisers had assisted German parachutists in the May occupation of the Netherlands. The newspapers caused paranoid agitation via relentless anti-refugee editorial. Two days after he became Prime Minister on the 10th of May 1940, Winston Churchill issued the now infamous order to collar the lot, and so began the arrests of thousands of so-called enemy aliens, 
many of whom had lived peacefully in Britain for decades. In the chaotic and sometimes cruel roundups that followed, thousands of Jews who had fled Nazi Germany were now imprisoned by the very same people in whom they had staked their trust. Status provided no protection. Oxford and Cambridge dons were arrested in university-wide roundups of students and professors, as were doctors, dentists, lawyers, and scores of the so-called degenerate artists, refugees, many of whom had settled around Hampstead Heath. The police picked up Rowitz and his performing partner in Blackpool, where they, they had just begun a run of sellout performances in the Grand Theatre. Despite their aesthetic similarities, each of the camps on the Isle of Man had its own particular character, which often reflected the temperament of inmates. Oh, have I drawn on that by accident? <laughs> Apologies. Um, Peveril camp, which housed British fascists and members of the IRA, for example, was boisterous and threatening, and the site of various riots and escape attempts. Central camp was known for its illustrious population of musicians, while Hutchinson had a pe peculiarly dense population of Jewish writers, poets, poets, painters, and sculptors. And as such, it became known simply as the artist's camp. In fact, Hutchinson was home to an unprecedented array of diverse talents, from Nobel-winning professors to lauded composers, award-winning journalists, and fated international lawyers, including one who claimed to count the Pope among, he, among his clients. Inmates included Heinrich Frankel, the journalist and chess setter, for whom, um, who, wrote the, who wrote and published the book, Help Us Germans to Beat the Nazis, for Victor Galantz, From Inside the Camp. There was Professor Gerhard Bersu, a world expert on Vikings who led various archeological digs in the surrounding Manx Hills using the help of other internees during his stay. And there was Dr. Bernhard Weiss, a former Berlin police chief who was famous for having sued Joseph Goebbels more than 40 times and won. There was the music critic Rudolf Kastner who claimed to have discovered the American violinist Yehidi, Yehidi Menuhin and the publisher Walter Neurath who following his release eloped and founded the publishing company Thames and Hudson with the wife of his former Hutchinson colleague, Wilhelm Fechtwang. There was even in the case of Peter Ward, a world-class athlete who had represented Great Britain in the Berlin Olympic Games. Through happenstance, Hutchinson camp was also home to a raft of eminent artists. The roster included Paul Hamann, a sculptor who made life masks of well-known English figures, including Winston Churchill's wife, Clementine, and there was Ludwig Meidner, considered by many of his contemporaries to be the greatest of all German expressionists. And most famously, it was Kurt Schwitters, the pioneering Dadaist artist in front of whose work the failed painter Adolf Hitler had once posed sarcastically. With such a high concentration of luminaries, the extraordinary inev inevitably occurred. On the first day of Hutchinson's opening, some men emerged from their boarding houses carrying chairs and ladders, which they proceeded to set up on the terrace lawn. Each man beckoned passers-by, and when they had a small crowd, began to hold forth on their specialist subject. Soon the lawn filled with speakers and their various audiences, like, as one observer put it, a scene from ancient Athens. A listener could wander freely between subjects, from Greek philosophy to explorations of the industrial uses for synthetic fibers to explications of Shakespeare's sonnets. Bruno Arons, a 62-year-old architect who had, during an illustrious career, designed Berlin's highly influential modernist housing estates, had thrived in the socially, politically, and culturally progressive Berlin of the 1920s. He immediately recognized the potential in this illustrious group of teachers inside the camp. Arons and his assistant, Dr. Klaus Hinrichsen, a 28-year-old art historian, approached the camp commandant, Major Hubert Daniel, and requested permission to organize a formal schedule of lectures. The pair chose their words carefully in an effort, as Hinrichsen later put it, to appeal to Major Daniel's vanity. They had already sensed that there was competition between the commandants of the island's camps, and they knew that Daniel would be more likely to accept their proposal if he believed it would give Hutchinson some kind of advantage over the others. Daniel initially expressed some concern that the lectures might be used by demagogues to issue violent calls to action. And indeed, during the morning of the camp's very first roll call, the artist Hermann Feckenbach, who had lost a leg as a German soldier in the First World War, had interrupted the major's speech, calling that all internees should go on a hunger strike to protest their captivity. 
So Arendt and Henriksen promised that wherever possible, all lectures and debates would be carried out in English. Major Daniel was a former advertising executive who was known as Danny to his friends. He relented and offered the pair a room on the first floor of the camp's administration building. Eleven committee members were, were chosen to oversee each of their specialist areas, from lectures to music, games to gymnastics. And each of the 45 houses was asked to select a liaison officer to communicate feedback to the organising committee. Under the committee's advice, Arons and Henriksen assigned daily lectures, organised theatre, music and poetry performances, and most urgently drew up a schedule of lessons and tutorials for the younger internees in order to prepare them for the exams that they would, hopefully, soon be freed to sit. Arons christened the outfit, which was founded just two days after Hutchinson's opening, the Cultural Department, but Major Daniel insisted that it be known as Hutchinson University, or in conversation, my Hutchinson University. The department's remit was wide ranging, to program lessons, arrange the borrowing of books from local and mainland libraries, to supply musical instruments for performances, and the organising and teaching of English at all grades of knowledge. Major Daniel's wife, Marjorie, you can see here in the middle, was a keen amateur artist who, as a teenager, had been forbidden by her parents from accepting a place in art college. As such, she was sympathetic to the artists in the camp, and she encouraged her husband to donate and secure materials, which were then distributed by the cultural department. By the end of 1940, more than 150 lecturers had spoken at Hutchinson, attracting crowds of up to 250 listeners at a time. The largest events, such as the musical performance given by Rowitz, were staged on the Lawn Square, and the most popular of these were watched by crowds that numbered in excess of 500 people. As part of the Camp University, the celebrated fashion designer and later weaver, Otto Hasheyer, established a school of textiles in the camp. And in order to support his petitions for release, Ludwig Vorschauer, a man much disliked by the artists in the camp, founded a technical school to teach younger internees electrical engineering. Technical knowledge overcomes any resistance, uh, went the technical school pun's motto, as you can see here, even internment. The school's engineers installed a tannoy system with speakers in each house to, allay, to allow Major Daniel to address the camp from the comfort of his office. As well as issuing important announcements, Major Daniel was known after a few afternoon drinks to, in a slurred voice, announce the cricket scores to the bewildered internees. Incidentally, a prolonged MI5 investigation into the technical school's founder, Warshower, eventually res resulted in his deportation. After years of interrogation, British agents established that this half-Jew had been recruited, albeit unwillingly, by the Gestapo as a secret agent tasked with stealing industrial secrets. His case was one of the scant few arguments in favour of the authorities' much criticised internment measures. The artists, of whom there were a great many, were also quick to organise. The most celebrated among them, such as Haman and Schwitters, were able to convince Daniel to secure them rooms to use as art studios. Uh, outside of the perimeter of the camp, although Schwitters succeeded in accidentally burning his one down. The group took younger artists, such as Peter Fleischmann, later Midgley, under their wing, providing not only training, but in Peter's case, writing letters to venerable art colleges around the country, asking them to take him on as a student. As many as 25 artists and writers would congregate daily in the so-called Artist Café which was situated in a large room that extended into the garden of house number 15. There was a strict rule that members had to be over the age of 20, to which Peter Midgley became the sole exception. The artist staged two exhibitions of work created inside the camp. And for the second of these, which was held in mid-November uh, mid 1940, Schwitters, despite having produced a range of works and a variety of styles in the camp, opted to display only a selection of his more traditional oil portraits, which he had begun to paint of Hutchinson's most prominent internees. The motivation for this decision may, have, may be that the collages for which he is best known had to date proven unpopular among fellow internees, some of whom had even spread rumours that he couldn't paint at all. Or it may simply have been the result of a financial calculation. The camp newspaper, which was published every month and edited by the former Berlin-based journalist Leo Freund, who was also known as Michael Corvin, reported that the artist's work on display at the exhibition would be offered for sale. 
Even Schwitter's orthodox portraiture failed to convince some internees. Professor Paul Jacobsar, a lecturer at Christ Church, Oxford, who specialised in ancient Greek vase painting, witheringly described Schwitter's in his diary as an amateurish, amateurish painter and a reciter of infantile poetry. This judgment was apparently biased by Schwitter's relationship with another Oxford academic in the camp, Robert Eisler, who Jacob's, Jacob Stahl despised. None of this they talked about while they were alive, by the way. Eisler, a Jewish-Austrian polymath, published books on a broad range of subjects from Christianity to astrology, and had, before his arrival at Hutchinson, spent 15 months imprisoned at Dachau and Buchenwald before fleeing to England. This painful journey, which left Eisler with a heart condition from which he never recovered, did nothing to temper Jacob Thal's appraisement of his colleague, whom he described as the perfect type of intellectual imposter. It's not quite clear what Eisner did to earn Jacob Thal's scorn, although perhaps a pinch of envy was involved. Jacob Thal makes reference to the enormous audiences who gathered to listen to his colleague's muzzle-headed lectures. Jacob Stahl particularly objected to a portrait that Schwitters had painted of Eisner, Eisner, which he considered to be more noble than the subject deserved. With great relish, Jacob Stahl recorded that Eisler had borrowed the gown, which he can be seen wearing in Schwitters' painting, from the daughter of the English camp doctor. She was, Jacob Stahl gleefully wrote, an undergraduate of an English university. Despite the camp's enviably rich cultural life, depression was rife. Many of the internees suspected many of the internees suspected an imminent invasion of Britain and believed that the British had carried out the Nazis' work for them by rounding them up, by rounding up and imprisoning so many Jews on the island. A clinical pathologist and a retired funeral director who were interned at the camp established a unit they dubbed the Suicide Consultancy, which offered lessons to any interested parties on the best and most painless way of killing oneself in the event that the island was invaded. Not everyone agreed with this course of action. The author, Heinrich Frankel, recalled a conversation that he and a group of other internees had in the sun one afternoon on the camp lawn. I quote, as the talk naturally got on to what would be the most dreaded prospect for all of us to fall into the Gestapo's hands, defenseless and alive, I said I knew I wasn't the only one here who, for such an eventuality, had a particularly sharp razor blade in readiness. Here I was interrupted by a simple German working man who happened to have had some rather grim experiences of the Gestapo's attentions. Razor blade be damned, he said. If those swine should catch me again, I wouldn't do their job for them. I would bloody well make them spend one of their bullets on me, and by God, I would use that last minute to tell them what I think of them. In the autumn of 1940, the atmosphere in the camp became more strained, and in the words of Professor Jacob Stahl, the Oxford lecturer, Hutchinson seethed with anger and excitement. The source of this frustration was the apparent capriciousness of who was picked for release and who was passed over. The feeling was captured in a contemporaneous cartoon which showed the Home Secretary Sir John Anderson turning a tombola with the odd name of an internee popped out at random. In Whitehall, the tide of opinion had, by the end of the summer, begun to turn. The British economist and government advisor John Maynard Keynes claimed that he had not met a single soul inside or outside the government departments who is not furious at what is going on. Meanwhile, pressure from Bloomsbury House, the headquarters for close to 30 different refugee organisations, helped to secure the first releases. Tess Simpson, who worked for the Society for the Protection of Science and Learning and who had helped bring many of Hutchinson's academics out of Germany in the 1930s, was instrumental in campaigning for their release from internment. The Quaker Bertha Bracey, who co-organised the kinder transport that rescued a number of Hutchinson's younger internees, including Peter Fleischmann, was chairman of the Central Department for Interned Refugees, and she frequently uh, visited the island, met with captives and captors, visited the arts exhibitions and campaigned for improved conditions. And finally, Helen Reuder, secretary for the Artists' Refugee Committee, worked hard for the release of the artists, although she, like all of the others, was often frustrated by how long it took to achieve any progress. Trying to get justice out of this internment business, she wrote in a letter at the time, is like climbing up a mountain of feathers for a star. Anecdotally, the elephant keeper from London Zoo was the first internee released from Hutchinson just a few days after the camp opened. After he was arrested, the elephants reportedly stopped eating and the zoo successfully petitioned the war office to have their keeper return to his post. 
Incidentally, there was also a lion tamer in Hutchinson, Johann Neunzer, known as Blick to the other internees, an animal catcher who worked with the lions at Chesington Zoo. Blick was less fortunate than his colleague, however, who remained in turn for almost a full year. While waiting for news of their release, most men in the camp would experience from day to day heightened versions of their natural emotions, both positive and negative. But an individual's overall attitude toward the, toward the experience of internment was often guided by their own temperament. The naturally optimistic were able to find in the camp's rich schedule of events, which included chess tournaments and boxing matches, sufficient distraction. But for the forlorn, the circumstances were, in some cases, almost unbearable. The lawyer turned artist Fred Ullman kept a diary in the camp. It's a document filled with accounts of dark days. 1st of October, bad day, grey sky, fear of winter. 11th of October, full of anxiety. 19th of October, constant depression. The art that Ullman produced in Hutchinson offers another unvarnished representation of his state of mind. Dark skies, ruined buildings, a child hanging from the gallows, skeletal figures rowing across a stormy sea, all motifs of the crestfallen. Still, there were moments of beauty and of redemption. Walter Zander was a lawyer and Jewish scholar whom one internee described as looking like a minor prophet with flowing hair and burning eyes. Zander was especially vigilant in the camp for those individuals whom appeared to be suffering. Leo Wurmser was one such case. Wurmser was, such a, was a formidable musician who had played in the Dresden and Vienna opera houses before he came to England. In Hutchinson, Wurmsa fell into such a fog of despair, fear and hopelessness that Zander would watch him staring, uh, sat staring at the barbed wire fence all day long. So Zander persuaded one of the camp's guards to smuggle him some plain paper books from the school where the soldier's daughter studied. After the guard passed a pile of these blue exercise books to Zander, he proceeded to spend the next of the day meticulously drawing musical staves in each page. Finally, Zander presented Wurmser with the book. The musician revived. He spent the next week carefully transcribing from memory the entirety of Beethoven's Fidelio opera. When he had completed the score, Wurmser gathered together a group of singers in the camp, and together they performed in front of the other men the famous Prisoner's Chorus from Beethoven's opera. In the context of the camp, the words of the piece assumed a freshly powerful quality. Oh, what joy in the open air, freely to breathe again, up here alone is life, the dungeon is a grave. I thought I would just play 60 seconds of, of that piece of music. Uh, obviously, I don't have footage from Hutchinson, but uh, here it is performed at the Met Opera in 2000. performance in Hutchinson, Zander said, was not the best that I have ever seen, but it was, without a doubt, the most powerful. By the summer of 1941, most of the artists and academics had been freed. Others were made to wait far longer. 
Iran, who had so usefully organized the camp schedule, stepped down from his role in October 1940 and passed organizational responsibilities to his former deputy, Klaus Hinrichsen. Arons, however, remained at Hutchinson until April 1942, and to fill his time, he set himself an imaginary brief to redesign the Isle of Man's waterfront, creating pencil, ink, and watercolor sketches of high-rise apartments in a grand 16-story harbor hotel. In one drawing, Arons sketched a ship sailing out of the island's harbor as the sun disappeared behind the horizon. A Bauhaus villa stands on the ship's deck, and the caption reads, the country house is transported from the IOM to England. Iran's hope, subliminal or otherwise, was that even if he remained interned, his work would find a way to make it back to the mainland, to be valued and to be celebrated. Those who attended the camp university treasured the memories of those strange, emotionally chaotic months throughout their lives. It was the best university I had ever attended, said Fred Ullman, the lawyer turned artist. I had been to three universities, and this was the best one. Kurt Schwitters was interned until the 25th of November, 1941. And although he was let out just before Christmas that year, it didn't stop him from creating a Christmas card for the other internees. He made one the previous year as well, and I've got a picture of both of them here, which I don't think have been seen before. In July 1945, Marjan Rowitz returned to the island where he had been imprisoned to deliver a performance billed as the first Isle of Man celebrity concert since the war. He would return to perform more than a dozen times in the months and the years to come. But no mention was made in any of the press reports or the reviews of these events that the pianist had once been a prisoner on the island or a graduate of the Hutchinson Camp University. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Now, are you going to stop sharing the screen so we can see yes. you, Simon? That was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Good. Well, I'm sure I speak for everybody when I say that you know, if we were able to clap collectively, we would. That was absolutely fascinating, engaging, amusing, entertaining. And I think one thing I'll say just immediately as a response to that is that you know we do laugh. There are some extraordinarily surreal and Kafkaesque you know, sort of moments in what you're talking about. And it's not pure comedy, is it? It is actually tragic comedy at the end of the day. And I think that's yes. important to, to keep in mind. Um, now, we no doubt have some questions already. Um, I'm just looking at the time. Yes, we certainly do have some time for questions. Can I just start the, roll, the ball rolling by asking you a very obvious question? What was it? What was the spark that set you off on your research? What prompted it all? Um, well, while, while I was um, researching my previous book um, that you mentioned in the introduction, I was in the National Archives and just found an unrelated sheaf of papers that had one of the uh, issues of the camp um, newspaper in there. And um, if you've ever seen one, they're online. I think the full run you can find online. But if you've, if you've never seen one before, it's quite a striking artifact. Um, of course, it was written by many of the journalists and writers in the camp and then illustrated by many of the artists. So uh, they're very fine pieces of work um, just in and of themselves. And that led me down down the rabbit hole. Right, I noticed uh, something called Robin Sampson actually has just typed exactly the same question I just put to you, so it's a good place to start and there are lots of others coming through. Um, uh, right, the title of the newsletter, yes, let's, let's just, that's a very precise question. The, newspaper, the, title of the what? newsletter, the newspaper that you're referring to? Oh yes, it's called um, The Camp. So uh, there were numerous uh, newspapers in, in more than just Hutchinson, in numerous of the, the camps ran their own uh, newspaper. The one in Hutchinson was, uh, they just decided to do it in English. It was initially um, edited by Leo Freund, but under his pseudonym, um, uh, um, Corvin. Um, and then after the war, in fact, um, another of the internees, Helmuth Weissenborn, who became a publisher, he was a, also an illustrator, um, published one of Michael Corvin's um, children's books as well so which ha which has a chapter all about the Isle of Man so um, yeah. It's fascinating isn't it these kind of connections that appear as you, you continue with the research. Um, fine, uh, something called Joe Oliver, um, related question, could you speak a little about your research process, how did you set about things, have you managed to speak to any surviving internees or Isle of Man residents? Yeah so I have spoken to one of the internees um, 
he is, uh, as far as I know, the only one who is still alive, but I may be wrong. There were uh, probably in excess of 2,000 people at Hutchinson at one point. Certainly the, on the first, the day that the camp opens, there were 415 internees. And by the end of July, uh, there were um, 1,205. Um, and then the camp remains open for throughout most of the war. Um, and so there were, there were lots of people that, that were there. But the only one I found who was still alive is a chap called Henry Ruger, um, who I found actually via the Wharf Mills project that you were talking about at the start, Monica. Um, other than that, it's been a process of really trying to speak to the family members of, of Hutchinson internees, and there are lots of names here that I recognize of, of um, people that I, I've spoken to that have been very generous um, with sharing their stories and, and any documents and letters that they have. Um, in particular, I would I'd just like to mention um, Klaus Hinrichsen, the 28-year-old um, art historian, was probably the um, most diligent chronicler of things that had happened in Hutchinson, and he, he contributed a chapter for a book and, and spoke regularly on it. He also wrote uh, um, a sort of more um, fine, in-depth in account of, of goings on in the camp um, before before he died, which I I'm not sure at what point in his life he wrote it, but um, his uh, son and his daughter very kindly shared that uh, with me. And it's very useful because it's got lots of names in there that I was then able to follow up with. And I work with a very talented researcher called Laura Berry, um, who is just fantastic at finding the living family members of people from that era. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's sort of the process. Yes, and one contact leads to another in my experience. It's a very rewarding process. Mm. Um, I yeah. have, looking at the plethora of questions that are coming in, um, several people have asked um, about um, the next stage that were the questions about enlisting in the British Army. Tell us about how many of them, what your not awareness is in uh, uh, as part of the story that you know, sort of the one way to get out. Yes. I understand it was to join to enlist for the Pioneer Corps. The yes, that's right. The Pioneer Corps was, was sort of the, the preferred route for many of the internees. The, the, f apart from the zookeeper and, the, and a couple of others, I think, I believe the second internee who was released had a special letter from the Pope, uh, which caused a great stir. Um, but, but predominantly throughout um, August and September, uh, the, it was mainly the academics who were released, and that was partly through Tess Simpson's campaigning, but in many cases because they were given appointments in America, and so they were freed, um, freed to to leave, um, and uh, and then thereafter you had to apply to the government. Basically, releases a number of categories under which you can apply uh, for release according to you know if you've got particular skills that can be useful for the war effort, um, and those those slowly expand eventually to include artists and musicians and um, the stories of of who helped those people get out are, are fairly well known. Uh, but another route, of course, if if you were not a uh, luminary or a famous person, was to join the Pioneer Corps, um, which would um, enable you to to leave the camp quite quickly, but then of course you had to be involved in, in the war effort. But, but of course, many of the internees wanted to do that and um, you know, wanted to prove their allegiance to the crown as it were in this way. Absolutely. Um, a question, another question from Robin Sampson here. Um, are there detailed records of the names of internees, the dates, which camps, etc.? What's the archival sort of situation? Yes, so a freedom of information request from about four or five years ago um, unlocked all of the alien cards that everyone, any foreign passport holder living in Britain at the time of war's outbreak had one of these cards. It lists uh, their birth date, where they were born, their um, profession. Um, and also, well, it, initially these were used to sort of, um, when um, refugees went in front of the panels to decide whether they were a threat to Britain or not, and they were categorized as, as being safe. This was usually marked on their card, but of course, then a few months later, everyone's arrested, regardless of, of um, what the panels decided. Um, these, uh, these cards also have the release dates. They don't have the, the date at which um, a refugee went into a camp, but they do have the date at which they left um, very precisely often. Um, 
and it's a searchable database on I think find my past it's subscription but you can uh, if you if you have someone that you're interested in you can you can search through that there, there's no the the only role formal roll call of Hutchinson internees is from I think 1943 by which time most of the so-called innocents have been freed not not all of them but the vast majority of the people that I've talked about today um, are released by the end of 1940 so that is sort of not that useful for, for my purposes at least. Um, so really I've spent a lot of time pulling out names from the accounts, from the letters, and trying to triangulate exactly who who this particular Fritz is <laughs> compared to that Fritz, because there's an awful lot of, um, of, of Fritzes. <laughs> um, and um, yes, and I've been creating sort of my own roll call that uh, you can see. I, I, have opened a website just in the last week or two, hutchinsoncamp.com, and on there I've listed all of the verified internees at Hutchinson with their release date and their stated um, profession as well. So uh, that might be worth looking at if you're interested. Uh, Simon, I imagine there'll be quite a few people in this audience who will want to be in touch with you for very personal reasons in many cases. What's the best way to do that? I mean, I could suggest simply that people write to us or through the contact. Uh, mechanism on the inside is outside of websites and I can then forward the emails to you. Is that probably the best way? Yes, so do better. Yeah, that's, fine. that's fine. Or uh, my um, website is simonparkin.com and that has an email address on there as well. So Lovely. I think we have time just perhaps for two more very much more specific questions. I have a question here. Um, yes, yeah. uh, where are we? Um, yes, could Simon please talk more about the archaeologist who was allowed to work outside the camp? Mm. Yes, I can. Uh, my research is ongoing with him, uh, but he, uh, Gerha Gerhard Bersu, B-E-R-S-U, there's a link to him on, on my website you can find. Apparently he was in Scotland doing a, some sort of archaeological dig trying to find the um, Browns table or something, I think. Um, uh, and that's when he was in turn, so he was taken from Scotland um, to Liverpool probably and then on to the Isle of Man. Um, he, was a la he was a very distinguished um, man and was given permission to um, do these, these um, digs outside and, and he took uh, Peter Fleischmann with him on one of them, I believe. Um, and uh, certainly another, a, a load of internees would go and help him because he's very interested in, I think, particularly um, uh, Viking archaeology on the Isle of Man at the time. I'm not sure how many times he went out, but I do know there's an anecdote in the uh, unpublished Henriksen account of um, a um, senior British army officer from the mainland driving past, I think, and seeing them all up on the hill <laughs> and sort of um, going to confront them or confront the British officer who was in charge of them all and going, what on earth is going on here? So, um, yeah, there's, it seems like a rich vein to, to explore more of what he was up to. Indeed, I feel we're going to have to wind up fairly soon, but just one last question, if I may. Um, yes, one of the speakers, I think it was on Monday. Oh, hold on, we have another one. Wait a second. Sorry, they're coming in thick and fast. Uh, yes, one of the speakers on Monday mentioned that some internees escaped by swimming to Ireland. Have you any idea if this is true? <laughs> Uh, I, I believe that the only escape attempt from uh, the Isle of Man came from Peveril Camp, which was not, uh, which, which was where the British fascists were and members of the IRA. And I believe they did in the harbour on the Isle of Man. I think everyone who had a boat was told to take anything out of the boat that could enable it to sail. But I think maybe two or three did manage to get in a boat and, and were picked up. I can't quite remember, but, but they weren't from Hutchinson camp and I don't believe they were, they were um, uh, refugees. And one last question I can't resist about the food in the camp. What have you found out about the food situation? I understand that there was some food deficiency initially and that some people became ill when overdosing on cheese when it became available. Um, well, I'm not sure about that. I, I do know that the quality of the food would depend very much on which cook you had in your house out of the 45 houses. And um, uh, Helmuth Weissenborn was had a reputation of being a fantastic cook. Um, and uh, other, other camp cooks definitely did not. Um, I've just actually received yesterday a letter from uh, that was written by an 18-year-old uh, court, uh, Tritel, Tritel, 